Hello everyone, thanks for joining this Pride Month campaign kickoff meeting. I think we're waiting on just a few people, but I'm conscious of time, so I might just get started, okay? Um, so for actually first, considering the theme of today's meeting, could everyone put their preferred pronouns in their screen names, please? I can see um, even Moon hasn't put hers in, and it was part of the inclusivity training last month, if you remember. Okay, thanks everyone. So we thought this group were the best internal stakeholders to join this sort of um, pride briefing brainstorm collaboration session uh, I've got a deck here that I'll be presenting and then we can let the thoughts just flow remember at this stage no bad ideas this is a safe space okay although creativity of course works best within limits so we do have some guidelines we'll be working to which i will be going over later okay there's only a couple of weeks to pull this campaign together but i think that we can all agree this is a very important time of year to be acknowledging so let's get to it representation 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 it is so important that we have gay people in our print and on-screen ads for this campaign okay it is pride month after all and i think these ads can have a really big impact so as i start to the deck i've pulled together some examples just to give us some potential ideas for you know starting points or things we might even want to avoid. So thank you again to the LBGTQIA plus network for sending over some case studies for me for this deck. I didn't know this. I don't know if anyone on the call did. Emoji react, thumbs up in the chat if you did know. But the first mainstream TV ad with LGBT representation was actually from IKEA in 1994. It was part of a campaign that included other types of people buying furniture for their homes. So they had parents adopting a child, a divorced mother, and the tagline was, it's a big country, someone's got to furnish it. So very fun, very fresh, very inclusive. And the ad with the gay couple um, aired in three cities, New York, Philadelphia, and Washington DC. And it did only appear after 10 p.m. So I think we can all agree that element is a little problematic um, and there was actually some backlash apparently so something called the family research council which is a uh, conservative think tank they announced that actually they actually encouraged a boycott of the stores and i have a quote here actually from patrick truman who was the group's director of governmental affairs very official they are not like other people in society Ooh, uh, homosexuals living in a committed relationship are 0. 0.000 whatever percent of 1% of households. This is part of the effort by homosexuals to be normalized in society. I think we can all agree, not very nice to think about. And I can see the crisis and comms team already looking worried. <laughs> But this was a long, long time ago, okay? Things are a lot better now. Um, and this is a quote from Taylor Telford at the Washington Post about where we were back in the 2010s. Queer people started showing up in ads as parents, romantic partners and employees rather than punchlines. In a 2013 ad for Amazon's Kindle, Paperwhite, a man and a woman chat while reading on the beach. The woman smiles and says, my husband is bringing me a drink right now, to which the man responds, so is mine. And the ad was among the first to use husband rather than boyfriend to reference a gay couple. I love that. Do you all love that? I think, let me know in the chat, right? This is what we want. Seeing the LGBTs as normal as any of us, that's what we're hoping to do with this new campaign, okay? Here's a gay person and that's cool and that's no big deal, okay? Oh, I can see a question in the chat. Are we going to be paying our queer creators for this campaign? Okay, so, okay, so I know I said there were no bad ideas, Amanda, but we do have a very tight budget um, so we will be working with people who are very passionate about this cause, okay, very passionate about um, LGBT representation, so it will be on a pro bono basis. Clar okay, clarity for pro bono, wh what I mean when I say that is that we will be working with them with some really incredible, they'll be working for some really incredible exposure rather than necessarily for pay. Hey, it's Rowan hijacking the Zoom call quickly to let Karen here know that exposure, in fact, 
doesn't pay the bills uh and so to say a big thank you to my patrons over on patreon for supporting the work that i do here and elsewhere if you're interested in becoming a member maybe checking out some of the perks i will leave the link in the description also there are actually some brands that do pay queer creators they work with even when it isn't pride month so just a quick thank you to return sponsor ritual for supporting this video they make multivitamins that are gluten and major allergen free and are based on a visible supply chain so you know where your ingredients are from and why they're there they share their sources suppliers and studies behind their key ingredients giving them usp verified certification a third party assessment of transparency that less than one percent of multivitamins have earned they are having a black friday slash cyber monday sale with a limited time offer of 40 percent off their products so if you've been thinking of trying them now is a really good time the woman 18 plus that i've been taking is designed to support foundational health and includes folate vitamin b12 and omega-3 dha all from vegan sources ritual has picked nutrients that are hard to get from our diets alone and designed the multivitamins to fill some of the most common nutrient gaps backed by a university-led clinical study it's a delayed time release capsule which means better nutrient absorption and it's gentle on your stomach so it can be taken once or twice a day with or without food to get 40 percent off your entire purchase use my code rowan ellis 40 or use the link in the description now back to the boardroom moving on um we did have some more campaign case studies sent over that i think we can all agree are a little out there probably not our cup of tea um so these benetton ads from the 90s for example um this one called condoms and this one is called aids like pow big impact uh but a lot of pr backlash of course benetton were actually sued for some of their print ads in the past and you know where are the sweaters here okay where's the product you know how are the consumers going to know what we're selling very unclear in these ads so i think uh, an example for maybe maybe things that we don't want to be straying into okay in the brainstorm speaking of product we have been talking to the product development team internally because we saw this very fun example from burger king uh, not a vertical i know but in 2014 they introduced the proud whopper which was a limited edition burger in some of their san francisco stores for pride week so very easy to implement very targeted it was a normal whopper with a rainbow wrapper that read uh we're all the same inside so great message very punchy and most importantly uh the ad reportedly reached 20 percent of the u.s population even just being in one city so big reach potential even on a very small product campaign i know that it's been brought up by the network um that we could explore a partnership of some kind with a charity or an organization um timing on that might be a little tight uh, but if someone wants to pick that up please let us know how it goes okay um these are more involved than us just handling things in house so that is something to bear in mind if you want to take on that uh you know as a as a project uh, in your own time oh our internal network did send over a slide for the deck an example from last year though if you uh, did want to get some inspiration this is tinder working with the human rights campaign which uh i can see on the slide notes very important lbgtq a plus civil rights organization so very high profile which is interesting they went very political with this collaboration i'm not suggesting that we go that far of course um but they decided they wanted to work with a campaign to end a policy in the us that banned gay men from donating blood Ooh, but um the learning here i think is that they use their service their product to do this so study participants were needed to end the ban so they gave Tinder users invitations to be those study participants. Okay, they spread the word amongst their customers and that ban ruling was um, was changed. So yeah, be thinking about what resources we might already have at our disposal that we can use. Uh, things like, you know, that, 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 that will really help stretch the budget. Oh, I've seen someone in the chat um, asking about the choice to avoid political topics. They say there are lots of examples of uh, brands equality, uh, endorsing equality policies, Microsoft, Coke, PepsiCo with Japan's proposed Equality Act. Okay, interesting. I did not know that. Well, of course, we of course do not operate in Japan. So I don't know if there'll be anything that would necessarily make sense here. We are living in an equal society in this country. So, okay, I can see some disagreement in the chat. I'm gonna say we'll make an action point for after the meeting to have the policy and legal team check if there's any petitions or things that we can maybe add our name to if appropriate of course but thank you for asking okay oh okay uh just seen sorry just seen the message in the chat from alan and sales apparently nike saw a 10 percent jump in 
income after partnering with Colin Ke- Kaepernick. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong, everyone. Um, is he a politician or okay? Thank you, chat. Okay, a political figure then. 10%. Well, that is definitely food for thought. We will definitely be putting the business case um for more political messaging forward to policy and legal i think so thank you again all but we are going to move we're going to move on we're going to get back on track okay okay so in the ideation process for this campaign we were really inspired by other brands that were doing it right um so levi's was a core example for us obviously not in our vertical but we can still learn from their results not only are they a very well regarded um legacy brand making high quality products they are also a really ethical brand from an optics point of view which we love um now you might not know that but levi's was actually i can see here the first corporation to provide equal domestic partnerships to same-sex couples in the u.s back in 1992 wow isn't that recent Whew. and um the first to support same-sex marriage in 2008 which is i mean that's pretty heartbreaking you know it's very it, it's emotional it's an emotional for all of us, I think, thinking about this, the struggles of the community so close to all of our hearts. Um, and so Levi's also donates money to the LBGTQIA plus charities and supports the building of something called Queer Britain, which is a museum here in the UK, which is obviously wonderful. And as we can see from the data here, this kind of action actually does translate into sales. People are significantly more likely to spend money with companies that share their values and are willing to abandon brands that don't. Oh, eek. <laughs> uh, LBG um, to uh, TQI a plus issues are particularly important to younger audiences along with sustainability with over 45 percent of consumers under 34 saying that they are more likely to do repeat business with uh, an lgbtqia plus friendly company and over half of those would use an equality focused brand over a competitor okay this data is from 2014 um so it's likely that these numbers are even higher now with ap- apparently 21 percent of gen z are identifying within the um that that rainbow okay so the the so-called pink pound here refers to the spending power of that community not sure about you but it feels a little stereotypical to call it pink but maybe that's just me uh which is currently estimated at six billion pounds per year in the uk and 900 billion in the us that is an incredible market for us to tap into okay you know making that community feel seen and heard and valid uh you know as consumers um just another quick case study american airlines saw its earnings from the lgbtqa plus community increased nearly 900 percent over five years after forming a team devoted to advertising to them from 20 million dollars to nearly 200 million dollars so it's clear that this is a community with a lot of purchasing power potential for us to tap into finally we're seeing more and more criticism of brands these days consumers really want to be reassured that their favorite company shares their values and of course it's important to our lgbtqia plus brothers and sisters not to feel left out or invalidated by marketing okay consumers are really empowered to speak up about their feelings about brands which is great um and they will share their concerns about a brand's values on social media and with friends and family so it is really important that our customers can see where we want to stand on this speaking of um here we have a slide that the corporate social responsibility team sent over i know tim from the team is on the call thanks for this tim okay his team is doing some amazing stuff getting our brand out into the world you know and doing some good along the way Okay, the work they're doing is really helping position us as the modern, ethically and socially conscious brand that we want to be seen as, okay? People love to feel they're making a positive difference with everything they purchase, okay? So they're doing an amazing job partnering with the PR department to make sure that this stuff is out there, okay? Uh, And I want to put out this phrase, good corporate citizenship, okay? Let's just sit for a moment with that, because that's exactly what we're doing here today. All right, doing good, but also acknowledging the corporate in that, right? Okay, we need to make sure that we can justify this within the budget, okay, with the sales data. We want to be thinking about KPIs from this point forwards to the campaign. Um, and then when I put you into the breakout rooms, I want that phrase, good corporate citizenship, 
to really be guiding your brainstorming process, okay? And I just want to say how proud I am, okay, of working in a company with such a dedicated LBGTQIA plus network, okay? We're really following in the footsteps of brands like Levi's. I really think that we can pave the way on this, okay, challenging that stuffy, corporate attitude you know it can be such a blueprint for allyship okay okay yay yay us um so again a big big thank you to the network who donated their time we had some really valuable discussions um about our employee research groups and what work still needs to be done okay you might think we've made lots of progress okay and we have we have um but there is still a a little tiny way to go. Um, And so I wanna encourage everyone to listen, okay, and learn and don't be embarrassed if you don't know anything. You know, we're all imperfect and showing up is honestly, you know, 95% of the battle, okay? Now, people might think of us as being, you know, big, scary, uh, global conglomerates, okay? But corporations are actually often at the forefront of social change, okay? So internal groups, that lobby for anti-discrimination policies and you know recognizing same-sex relationships back in the day um really paved the way for marriage equality to be law okay um so which is obviously an amazing achievement and 96 percent of companies listed in the fortune 100 prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation compared to only 57 percent of u.s states that prohibit discrimination in state government employees something to think about okay similarly Some stats I got from the network, these are 79% of Fortune 100 companies offer benefits to same-sex partners or employees, sorry, partners of employees compared to 27% of states. Okay, and they're a Fortune 100 company, so they must be doing something right, right? Okay, let's not underestimate the power of an affirming and harmonious workplace. Okay, we always say here that we're a family and families sometimes have to have difficult conversations, okay? And I've had some, okay, over the past few weeks. You know, we want to show the staff that they are welcomed here. If there's anything bothering them, they are empowered to create positive change, okay? Knowing that we accept them for who they are, okay? Within the framework of the business. Um, So over two thirds of Fortune 100 companies that adopted domestic partnership benefits in the 1990s did so after facing pressure from ERGs or other forms of mobilized LGBT groups, okay? And isn't that wonderful? Okay, that they felt that they felt that they could do that, okay? You know, I don't wanna get emotional, but I'm so proud of working at a company that, where people feel comfortable to be themselves, okay? Okay, I've put the details of the uh, um, the network on screen, and I do encourage everyone to join, okay? Whether as a member of the community or as a proud ally, okay? Please do be aware that any meetings should take place outside of work hours, okay? Once your contracted duties have been fulfilled. You know, this is a, a brilliant opportunity for you to socialize and meet like-minded people, okay? So don't let it get in the way of your actual job, but yes, please do join, okay? Details on the screen. Oh, finally, bit of a downer to end in, but as with any campaign, it's important to be aware of any potential negative consequences. Ugh, I know, but very important to talk about, okay? So the lovely comms team has helped to identify some reputational risks to look out for in this campaign. Okay, I'll just run through those quickly now, because of course we wouldn't want anyone to feel offended by our campaign, Ugh, of course, and we don't wanna lose any of our key audience segments. So we are aware that there has been some controversy around corporate pride campaigns in recent years okay thank you to the interns who kindly collated some uh, viral tweets and memes for us about this which do a good job of highlighting what we'd like to avoid with this campaign okay also thank you to caleb who personally shared with me some really interesting articles about uh pink capitalism which were really informative for me personally about how corporations aren't doing enough to support our LGBTQAI plus brothers and sisters, okay? I won't go into that now, but they are linked on the slides if you'd like to look at them in your own time. Okay, she also shared with me this data from Nielsen, which found that outside of Pride Month, only 1% of ads included LGBTQ plus characters or topics, which can, you know, lead to a feeling of inauthenticity around those brands for some people in the community. Now, I personally don't feel that this is a huge concern for us since we do have a lot of B2B business within the company. Uh, There's much less visibility on our offering for people to find something to criticize in our products and services and in our ads and campaigns, okay? Um, 
given this, our campaign brief is going to focus more on celebrating your authentic self and being who you are, you know? A message that I personally think is very uh, vital and affirming and important and really needed right now, okay? We will, of course, have to change the logo back to our usual colorway after the end of the month as those are the specific colors that have been approved by our designers, okay? And we, we did pay them a lot of money to design the logo, so they do know what they're doing. Uh, we can't go changing it now. Uh, but just a reminder to everyone that only the approved Pride version of our logo is to be used during the campaign, okay? Uh, we did specifically procure that from our department's budget uh, and any other Pride-related assets should not be used. I know there was some discussion on the use of the uh, Progress Pride flag, but as per the company-wide memo, the design team have approved a more traditional Pride flag design, okay, to align with our heritage messaging. Just wanted to mes mention that very quickly, I know, I'm the bad guy, but... Just wanted to mention that on the call uh, before we go into the breakout rooms. Okay, I'm clicking the breakout room button now. I'll be popping in and out of each group to see how you're doing. We're looking just for any ideas for the campaign, okay? And then we'll come back together and pick your favorites and go from there, okay? How long do we need? How does 10 minutes sound? This is Godzilla. And this is King Ghidorah. They're creatures known in action movies as kaiju, giant monsters which often attack major cities and each other. Godzilla originally sought to destroy Tokyo, but over the years, the storytelling around him changed. And so he went from villain to hero, as he was used to protect humanity from ever more powerful evil kaiju bent on destruction. I'm sitting on, well, I guess, Tokyo. We often speak about companies as if they are essentially the same as these massive creatures. We perceive them as these big, powerful entities. Apple announces this, Meta decides that. We speak about how they might be a danger to us and how we might be able to use them as a force for good. We understand the wide-reaching and lasting impact they can have. Importantly, people often believe that they have some kind of sway over these companies in the same way that we see the later iterations of Godzilla being brought onto the side of humanity. But are they just tricking themselves into thinking that they're the ones controlling Godzilla.org, when in fact it's an uncontrollable entity from the depths of capitalism, which acts entirely in accordance with its own interests. Let's break this down using our Godzilla metaphor. Godzilla, the good kaiju, is one of these ally corporations. King Ghidorah, the bad kaiju, is queer repression and inequality. Tokyo is where this fight is taking place, so society, physically, socially, and politically. The tactics used in the fictional battle are obviously beating the hell out of each other, but in real life, it's things like good representation in adverts, internal policies, political lobbying, and more. How might we go about figuring out what is really going on in this fight? Turns out looking at the issues with using kaiju as a weapon maps surprisingly well onto the actions and impetus of corporations and their place in the fight for queer liberation. Anything outside of Tokyo is toast. When we look at the limitations of fighting kaiju with a kaiju, we might point out that that protection is limited, that the good kaiju is only protecting what it is told to. Anyone outside of this realm of protection doesn't get looked after. If you live over here, outside of Tokyo, and you can't get in, then the bad kaiju may well kill you. Capitalism is structured around exploitation of labor, including rainbow capitalism, when companies attempt to co-opt the queer movement and queer consumers for profit. It's often tokenistic and surface level, with outwardly performative shows of support which don't necessarily go any deeper. This structure means that anyone who doesn't or can't contribute to a normative capitalist society is often left outside of it. Marginalized people are hardest hit by this, particularly people of color and disabled people, but anyone who doesn't live up to the white, cis, male, able-bodied, neurotypical ideal of a model worker can be affected. As a group, queer people are underemployed and underpaid, subject to workplace discrimination and experience housing insecurity at a much higher rate than straight people do. In the US, 3.9 million LGBT workers live in states without clear statutory protections from discrimination in employment. In the UK, YouGov survey in 2018 found that 1 in 10 LGBTQ plus BAME employees had been physically attacked by customers or colleagues in the last year, and 1 in 8 trans people had experienced the same. The same report found more than a third of LGBTQ plus employees had hidden their queer identities at work for fit of discrimination. A report from Stonewall and Crisis found that almost 1 in 
in five LGBT people have experienced homelessness at some point in their lives. Historically, we've been outside of Tokyo, on the fringes of society, many of us barred from contributing to or benefiting from society in the same way as our straight and cis counterparts, both in the world of work and outside of it. Ostensibly, representation in media, including in advertising, is important in the struggle for queer rights. It can promote awareness, normalise a spectrum of identities and experiences, and eventually lead to acceptance. But is being seen as normal and non-threatening really our goal? Back in 2009, scholar Rod P. Githens, in his paper Capitalism, Identity Politics and Queerness Converge, LGBT Employee Resource Groups, pointed out how brand campaigns and ads that included queer representation had their flaws. Such ads usually contain a sanitised version of queerness that rarely includes those on the fringe. These ads most often appeal to a straight and cis-normative audience, offering a restricted view of queerness, creating further problems for us down the line. Even if we normalise the concept of being gay, we'll have created a world in which being gay itself means something narrow and sanitised, not a world in which the full range and breadth of queer experiences are understood and celebrated. The idea that we can buy our way into social and legal protection from discrimination, harassment and abuse is rooted in an idealised and naive view of capitalism to me, one which argues that if we simply demonstrate our worth then we'll be allowed in, into society, into Tokyo, to be protected from the kaiju of capitalism, by partnering with the good kaiju and bargaining for our acceptance into Tokyo so we can be under its protection, who are we abandoning outside? This kind of respectability politics only undermines our struggle for collective liberation by reducing queerness only to its most palatable elements. Collateral damage. In addition to those people who are too queer to be let into Tokyo, who are left outside unprotected by the kaiju, the people inside Tokyo aren't exactly safe either. Notoriously, the amount of collateral damage in monster movies is huge. Billions of dollars of buildings, possessions, businesses, infrastructure crushed underfoot. Any fight between two giant monsters is going to wipe out much of the city that they're attempting to protect or attack. A metaphorical fight between Godzilla and King Ghidorah is no exception. Trying to use capitalism to counter injustice has its own collateral damage. To begin, let's talk about spotlighting, bringing a lot of attention to one person or group which is highlighted by a campaign. When not done responsibly and with support in place, any positive intention is more than outweighed by the negative consequences faced by the subject of that intention. This might be a group or individual who's sometimes elevated to become the face of an entire community within the mainstream public eye. If not well considered, with queer people inputting and advising on the campaign itself, the potential for negative backlash may not be well understood leading to harassment of those involved and a reversal of public support from the brand. In the midst of this year's trans panic, Starbucks, a brand which has typically marketed itself as liberal and progressive, instituted a nationwide ban across the US of Pride-themed merchandise in its stores, citing concerns about right-wing backlash and the safety of its staff and customers, just as Target did, pulling its Pride collection from the shelves. Customer service staff in these environments were apparently being put in danger by their employers' poorly thought-through campaigns, launched without considering how to properly handle such backlash. Those employees who were openly queer were at even more of a risk in those circumstances. Even when a campaign is done well, there remains the question of who profits. The vast majority of profits generated by successful campaigns will be dispersed amongst the top execs and shareholders, and they won't find their way down to the underpaid or unpaid queer people who help make the project a success. Another consideration is which brands advertise themselves to the queer community at all. For example, alcohol brands have a history of targeting queer consumers with their advertising and sponsorship. 50 years ago, the primary brands advertising to queer people at all were alcohol and tobacco companies, who saw little risk in alienating an existing customer base, because religious conservatives were most at risk of protesting the move, were not part of that target audience. Absolute Vodka became the first mainstream brand to take out a full-page ad in a gay magazine in 1981, and the 80s and 90s saw the emergence of alcohol and tobacco adverts targeted specifically at queer consumers in gay publications like The Advocate, since mainstream media outlets still prohibited LGBTQ plus representation presentation in many cases. We also see this in sponsorship deals, like the fact that Absolute Vodka again was an early sponsor of RuPaul's Drag Race during its first four seasons, and featured prominently in the episodes of the show. The close association of queerness and alcohol has been fostered over the last five decades, thanks in large part to the fact that queer people, ostracised from mainstream society, ended up developing our own distinctive bar cultures to socialise in secret. Bars were once the refuge of the queer community, the sites of multiple acts of protest and resistance including, of course, the Stonewall 
in. In that way, alcohol brands seem well-placed to support the community itself, right? However, by associating Quinn as so closely with alcohol, providing funding for primarily venues and events that center around it, a culture of queerness that revolves around drinking has endured. Queer people are more likely to drink alcohol and to drink excessively than the population as a whole. With high rates of alcohol and substance abuse in our community, is it doing more harm than good to continue partnering with alcohol brands in the same way? We also suffer as a result of a lack of sober spaces, which prevents queer people who don't drink from feeling fully able to participate in their community. This is particularly problematic when it comes to spaces for queer youth, as so many queer spaces revolve around alcohol consumption and are therefore adults only. It feels fair to question if the potentially negative impacts of the community have been properly considered by brands looking to use our symbols and celebrations to gain consumer loyalty and profitability. And finally, maybe the biggest form of collateral damage we deal with when it comes to rainbow capitalism, it's the same kind that regular non-rainbow capitalism also causes. Things like labour conditions and environmental damage. As Meghna Mehra from the All India Queer Association says, Many companies prefer to bring out ads online during the Pride Month for promotional purposes, but if we may ask them, how many of them hire queer individuals? How many are not doing labour rights violations? Starbucks has been known for underpaying the employees and union busting. How can a company like that claim to be inclusive by mere ads? If companies aren't also actively working to lessen their environmental impact and reduce exploitation in their supply lines, for example, then whose equal rights are they protecting? If you make it inside Tokyo, you might technically get the protection of Godzilla, but you're still in need of protection from him. They were our enemies, and they might be again. Initial portrayals of Godzilla saw him as a destructive figure, but after years of rampaging, filmmakers shifted his character to a more heroic figure. So too have we seen a shift in companies going from actively opposing the queer community to including us in their campaigns. We now find ourselves in a world where certain versions of queerness are palatable, marketable, and slowly being absorbed into the capitalist system as a new target for corporations to exploit. It's vital to remember that past actions of these companies and the fact that the movement towards public support for LGBT LGBTQ plus people or issues, it's not an inevitable forward movement. Currently, subsections of the queer community are seen as viable target markets for advertising. Corporations looking to boost their reputation and maximize profits from a range of demographics might jump at the chance to sell a t-shirt with a rainbow flag on it. But these brands owe us nothing. And not long ago, queer people were seen as inappropriate to feature in the same ad campaigns that they're now desperate to flog. We can see this in the in-between stage of queer representation in the 1990s, when there was a trend of ads that featured characters who could be queer but weren't explicitly so. Corporations were hedging their bets, trying to appeal to a new audience without alienating their old ones. They were, I guess, doing a version of advertising queer baiting. After market research showed that lesbians made up a segment of Subaru's customer base, for example, they leaned into the so-called gay vague advertising approach, with one of their mid-90s print campaigns featuring Subarus with license plates including Xena Lover, a reference obviously to Xena Warrior Princess, and P Towny, a reference to Province town, Massachusetts, a popular gay vacation destination. If you knew the reference, then you would understand, but if not, you wouldn't be put off. As public perception has changed and customer values have shifted, brands have followed suit by creating ads which feature queer people more explicitly. But let's not credit them with leading the way. For one thing, many brands limit their support for queer people just to Pride Month, as though that's the one month of the year when it's acceptable for queer people to be front and centre, before returning to their old standard for the rest of the year. In 2021, a survey by Nielsen found that outside of Pride Month, a new 1% of ads included LGBTQ plus characters or topics. Companies are often far more interested in trying to gain the support of the queer community than they are in showing support in return. By financially supporting brands which seem to exploit the queer community through pinkwashing rather than through genuine change, we aren't helping to defeat King Ghidorah. We're helping massive corporations rehabilitate their images as beacons of progress. Often once you dig below the surface, these companies are not the allies they claim to be. Companies that take advertising money, including Facebook and Instagram, both owned by Meta, have been found to do so even from companies promoting hate speech adverts. We can't necessarily trust the kaijus attacking us 10 years ago to protect us now, and we can't rely on corporations to defend our best interests, especially when those interests are in conflict with their bottom line. They're born from the same place as the bad kaiju. Ultimately, 
This is the issue. Kaiju and corporations aren't inherently moral creatures. They have their own interests at heart. When we talk about monster movies, we're often looking at creatures with an innate drive towards destruction, or at least with natural instincts or needs which are intrinsically linked to human suffering, needing to destroy cities to create a viable habitat, or seeing humans as a food source, for example. And if we look at the innate drive of corporations within a capitalist system, we can see that companies are fundamentally driven by profit rather than morality. All it might take is a sway in public discourse and consumer buying habits to change their policies. They aim to extract as much profit as possible from a potential market. If aligning with progressive attitudes will further that end goal, then they will pursue that path. And queer people can be profitable. The so-called pink pound, the spending power of the LGBTQ plus community in the UK, is worth billions in British business alone. But it seems fair to point out that if gaining a queer customer would lose a business to cis straight customers, the policies and support would almost certainly shift. In fact, in many cases, they already have. Consider the case of Dylan Mulvaney. Dylan is a trans woman who gained popularity online with her Day X of Being a Girl series, documenting not just her transition, but also her life in general. Dylan's vibe was very much sweet and wholesome, almost always wearing a big smile and speaking with a sense of boundless positivity. At the beginning of 2023, she did a sponsored TikTok with Bud Light, and the backlash was knit in media. There was a call for a boycott from right-wing and anti-trans users, which proved to be immensely powerful as it became a rallying point for those who wanted to send an enduring message, not just to Bud Light and its parent company, but any business that might be thinking of including trans voices in future campaigns. Sales fell, and so did the company's stock value. And the CEO, Brendan Whitworth, came out two weeks after the video was posted with an infuriating nothing statement. We never intended to be part of a discussion that divides people. We are in the business of bringing people together over a beer. Moving forward, I will continue to work tirelessly to bring great beers to consumers across our nation. But what was most disappointing was the lack of internal support for Dylan from the brand. She's spoken out about the lack of communication from their team, even through the public torrent of abuse that they were all well aware of. For a company to hire a trans person and then not publicly stand by them is worse, in my opinion, than not hiring a trans person at all. It gives customers permission to be as hateful and transphobic as they want. And Dylan's fear seems to have been born into reality, with similar tactics used against Target, a brand that has long had an annual pride collection on its shelves, as reported by journalist Helen Reid in Reuters. Anti-trans activists filmed themselves going into stores, harassing employees and ripping down pride displays. One of the designers involved with the collection, who is trans, was inundated with death threats and online abuse. Citing safety concerns for the staff, Target agreed to remove certain items from a collection, but not before losing billions in market value. A recent GLAAD survey found that 70% of non-LGBTQ adults agree that companies should publicly support the LGBTQ community through hiring practices, advertising, and or sponsorships. Yet this moral support for the majority of the general public is clearly not enough when profit is on the line. And ironically, the bowing of brands to these prejudiced enclaves that are so vocal about their hatred only emboldens them. This increase in the public awareness of transphobia alongside the well-worn transphobic talking points that come with it has no doubt contributed towards seeing a decline in public acceptance of trans people within the UK in the past few years. The British Social Attitudes Survey showing just 64% of the British public described themselves as not prejudiced towards trans people last year, down from 82% the year before. I think the most crucial takeaway from the Bud Light case for me is that we simply would not have known that Bud Light weren't going to commit to being good corporate allies if the campaign had gone according to plan. We only saw this abandoning of their supposed support because it all went sideways. Begging the question, are all brands just one PR moment away from abandoning their public principles? Companies can't be relied on to be wielded as a weapon for queer liberation. We can look back and see them do good and make that narrative, but that policy or action only happened because it was a profitable moment for corporate allyship, or they saw it being so in the long term. This lack of authenticity might be seen publicly as a lack of knowledge, sustained support, or meaningful contributions to the queer movement, or trying to claim active allyship. It also manifests in a a lack of support for all of the community, particularly a lack of support for trans and non-binary people, while trying to use support for gay people as evidence of LGBTQ plus allyship. Admittedly, the results are sometimes just sort of hilarious, like Burger King's 2022 Pride campaign, which paired two top or two bottom buns together in their visual creative, a seemingly clear indication of the lack of actual input from queer people on the campaign. Or maybe there was, but they were definitely trolling. We see many companies put together a Pride campaign running during a period of historic protest and demands for equality that don't in fact 
support the queer community any other ways. They use the optics of Pride Month to sell their own products, but don't use it to meaningfully give back, donate, or engage in politics in a way that could affect positive change. We also see support that does come be rolled back, sometimes almost immediately. Innocent Smoothies tweeted earlier this year about a training session with trans charity mermaids, but deleted the tweet after backlash from transphobic users. There was a marked dip in financial support during Pride this year too, with 22% of US Pride organizers reporting declines in sponsorship opportunities, and many LGBTQ plus creators and influencers noting a lack of clients at once was the busiest time of year for them, which many rely on as a significant part of their annual income. I can attest to this from a personal point of view, because if you look back at my video essay that I released during Pride Month, you might notice that it doesn't have a sponsor either. This shift has been attributed by many to the potential public backlash for supporting the queer movement, particularly supporting trans rights. Others note that previous criticism of inauthentic rainbow washing has led some brands to backtrack any public support at all in fear of getting it wrong, specifically how any kind of active misstep might hurt their profits and public image going forwards, preferring to do nothing and hide in a non-offensive kind of inaction. Carlos A. Bell, author of The Queering of Corporate America, How Big Business Went From LGBT Adversary to Ally, explained in a recent interview, while political pressure on corporations in the US, before 2018 or so, was coming primarily from LGBTQ plus rights groups, there is now equal or more pressure being put on large companies by those who support legal restrictions on transgender equality. Large companies in the US are therefore treading more carefully and generally being less outspoken in criticizing anti-LGBTQ plus laws. In my opinion, that is unfortunate, but it does show the limits of relying on corporations to advance progressive causes. Allyship is not built into this good kaiju as standard. It has to be justified as a business case or a strategy. Rod P. Githen's paper that I referenced earlier looked at the achievements made by internal employee networks. He is, however, quick to point out that this form of activism within companies is predicated on the groups being allowed to exist in the first place, explaining, it has become essential that employers keep their workers happy in order for workers to have meaningful careers, which leads to maximizing productivity. The key caveat here being that if the happiness of workers didn't have an effect on profit, it would not be of any concern. Or if it was possible to hire workers who didn't feel empowered to ask for their happiness to be considered, that would be potentially preferable. He also pointed out that, Activism within corporations is necessarily more conservative than activism occurring through community-based groups. In fact, Rayburn contends that some of the success of ERGs was a result of the contrasting images of professional appearing employees seeking change from inside the company when compared to queer activists outside the corporation. According to Rayburn's evidence, corporate executives were happy to deal with a calm and collected employee when they considered the alternative. Outside of worker-run groups and networks pushing for internal social change, many large companies will have an eye to what is known as corporate social responsibility. This is when companies incorporate social and environmental issues into their business model. Ostensibly, this seems like sound ethical policy, which should hold businesses to account. However, critics are quick to point out that CSR is almost always created and monitored internally. The budget is set internally, the goals and policies, the aims and priorities. When I worked at Penguin Random House, I worked alongside their CSR department quite a bit. Talk of free books in low-income schools and drives for literacy were always connected to brand loyalty and the wider business cases for generosity by the higher-ups. We need to make sure the logos are big enough on any materials that are sent out that kids will connect the potential positives that derive from the projects is coming solely from the Penguin brand. Budget put into CSR can be a de facto marketing budget if you play your cards right. As Professor Joanne Bauer wrote in an article in 2014, the problem with an approach that lets business define corporate responsibility is that it is not grounded in a set of principles about what it means to be a responsible business. Corporate social responsibility is whatever companies want it to be, and often what is most convenient. CSR can give a boost to companies' PR, projecting an ethical image without necessarily putting in the work behind the scenes. I read a truly incredible article published by Financia Worldwide in 2018 for this video research entitled Corporate Social Responsibility, the Capitalist Dilemma, which lays out the complexities of engaging with CSR as a capitalist, concluding that the capitalist is working between two tight ropes, the desire to maximize profit for the benefit of shareholders, and at the same time must consider, albeit in varying degrees, depending on his or her philosophical standpoint, other stakeholders in the business. Regardless of whatever strategy the capitalist manager deploys in achieving the objective of profit maximization, albeit with or without a CSR mindset, he or she will be judged for it one way or the other, favorably or not. The very concept of a CSR mindset 
is clearly seen as optional, a quirk even that some businesses might want to consider, but which is not innately tied to a capitalist endeavor. If profit is a primary motivator of these giants, then some suggest it stands to reason that we can use it to control them. This is where consumer tactics like boycotting come in, using collective spending power to nudge decisions for or against political beliefs. Boycotts have worked in the past, but if we compare these successes to the number of boycotts called that don't result in meaningful change, it looks less and less like a reliable tactic. Think of the impact that one human can have against King Ghidorah here. That might be one person boycotting. Even if they go all out pummeling their fists into its massive feet, it's not even going to feel it. Maybe they're joined by a bunch of other people. But to these creatures towering as tall as skyscrapers, it would be like ants running across your shoes. Dips in profit from one person not buying the product. Even a group of people to large businesses is almost always outweighed by the people who continue to shop with them. Marie Schrister, Professor of Operations and Information Management, has pointed out the reality of most boycotts. Boycotts are rarely the precipitating factor for change. Rather, they bring attention to an issue and signal the magnitude and intensity with which a group feels a particular way. In most cases, a small minority of people call for a boycott that the wider community fails to support by taking substantive action. The success of boycotts for large companies is also hard to measure, with the cause of any dips in profits not necessarily linked to the boycott itself. The public nature of boycotts can also have the reverse effect, with people opposed to the moral stance of boycotters deliberately buying from the targeted companies, essentially serving to balance out or mitigate any loss in profits. But it's perhaps understandable that people rally around the idea of boycotts. After all, it makes it feel like you can affect real change by essentially doing nothing. But are we deluding ourselves into thinking that we can control Godzilla and have it fight the battle for us? Because it feels like the easiest thing to do. Can commercialism ever be a tool for true liberation? After all, when we look inside the lived realities of workers inside the companies we hope to engage with as de facto allies, a troubling image reveals itself. A recent survey by LinkedIn of LGBTQ plus professionals found that 25% of respondents have been intentionally denied career advancement opportunities because of their identities, and 31% stated that they had faced discrimination and microaggressions in the workplace. Hardly the vision of queer utopia you might be hoping for from the internal workings of a supposed kaiju saviour. But it's not a kaiju. This metaphor is based on how we perceive big business. We talk about new menu items that McDonald's is launching, or that cringe post from Walmart, or this decision or that by Apple, or Disney or Lidl, and this language, this framing, is why the kaiju metaphor works, why it seems so apt. Godzilla versus Nestle coming to a cinema near you this Christmas. Except we need to alter the traditional idea of a kaiju in the metaphor if we want to really dig into this topic. Because companies aren't monolithic creatures. They're made up of people. They're hundreds, sometimes thousands of people all toiling inside a massive man-made kaiju structure. It's not one monster with one brain stamping over a city, watching its own feet trample those below. It's a collective of people pressing one of thousands of buttons in one of hundreds of compartmentalized sections, many of them unaware of the extent of the destruction around them. A person might be easier to appeal to than a kaiju, but that many people? People who, in order to earn money to afford to survive in the perilous city below, need to keep pushing those buttons. Who are told that their job relies on continually rising profit, whose management leadership could change at any moment, who are given new strategies, new targets, new pressures each quarter. It might well be easier to persuade Godzilla to act in support of queer liberation. In some ways, people are distanced from the human impact of their decisions when it comes to their work. They're just a piece of the puzzle, and they feel their lack of power acutely. And the effect of the working environment and ethos can be all consumed. That's just the way things are done. You won't be able to push through something like that. Keep your head down. Decisions that on your own might feel immoral can be justified and protected with the sentiment that it's not in the budget this year. Take Dylan Mulvaney. No one at the company, all clearly knowing what was going on, made the human decision to reach out to her. Perhaps they were told not to, or assumed someone else would do it, or because the shield of the company meant that they didn't have to face the impact of their collective decisions. The political beliefs of those individuals at the top of the ladder, rather than the thoughts of workers below them can have huge impacts. We see brands donating to political campaigns. The company that owns Bud Light is itself a major donor to the Republican Party in the US, alongside Target, Amazon, and many others. Often these companies will also donate to candidates from the Democratic Party or even independents. They 
not necessarily on political loyalty, but specific policies that will benefit the bottom line and profits. Being seen to side with Democrats can bring spending power from consumers, but getting low tax, low oversight policies through into law can help maximise the profit from that income. In 2018, for example, AT&T donated a million dollars to the Trevor Project during Pride Month, but it also donated more than $2.7 million in the same year to politicians with anti-LGBTQ plus policies. These policies are the collateral damage for the wider goal of pushing into power those with an interest in policies that benefit business owners. When you peel back the manufacturer's skin of the corporate kaiju, you also see the impact this all has on LGBTQ plus people within the system too. Often marginalised workers made to carry the burden of an unwelcoming or even hostile workplace, or else do work for free to improve their own experiences. And the company's engagement with diversity and inclusion in the outside world, the pressure of their opinion to be the correct one, becoming the de facto voice for gay people or trans people or black or Muslim or Asian or disabled people in the workplace it can be immense. I think many of us saw in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement gaining more traction across business in 2020, the internal meetings and discussions from management around diversity, the single workshop sessions by outside companies to train people on bias, never to be heard about again, the request for teams to create goals that are seemingly picked from thin air, and the lack of meaningful change to the experiences of the black staff they actually already had. And then, once the public discourse had faded, so did the energy for most of these policies and changes internally anyway. The final battle. I think the most important thing here for me is to stress the fact that corporations cannot be allies. They aren't even helpful tools we might be able to rely on if the situation becomes too dire. In fact, that might exactly the moment that they work actively against us. It feels dismissive, however, to not acknowledge the huge amount of power they hold in our society. Their money can help fund campaigns, their ads can have impactful representation or leave queer creators out to the wolves, and they control the working rights of millions of people. As such, they have the potential to impact the lives of not just those queer people that work directly for them, but also the lives of people affected by bills that they fund. There have been over 500 anti-LGBTQ plus bills introduced in the US this year alone, including those banning trans children from playing sport or receiving adequate medical treatment. Brands can have a bigger impact than a once a year rainbow of five version of their logo, but we shouldn't be relying on them for that. They've let us down before and they will again and again. And every time they go back on a promise to the community or a statement of support or a decision of inclusion, they embolden the people proposing these bills. There's a tactic that gets talked about a lot in relation to climate activism, of targeting big companies to have the most impact. After all, if a manufacturer is pressured into cleaning up their fuel and processes and materials, it would have a massive overarching impact that an individual consumer of those products wouldn't be able to have by simply recycling the already made products. And I do think that that makes sense for certain types of activism, including climate change, especially because a lot of the proposed changes would be difficult to reverse or walk back on. Changes to manufacturing and materials can be a measurable and meaningful change in comparison to one-off pride campaigns that focus more on PR than on long-term progress. And internal policy changes might not be useful for the queer community at large, but might be instrumental in changing material experiences of queer people working within that company, giving access to medical insurance that covers gender-affirming care, partner benefits for all relationships regardless of gender, stringent anti-discrimination policies, they might all contribute towards positive change from within. However, ultimately, there are limits to the work these companies can do, even ones that are determined to capitalise on the pink pound, who have LGBTQ plus people in leadership and who vocally oppose these laws and bills, because capitalism itself the portal from which these kaiju sprung is intertwined with issues that the community faces at disproportionate rates. Wealth inequality, homelessness, police violence, job precarity, a prison system that runs for profit, especially when we factor in the experiences of those in parallel vulnerable communities due to their race or class or disability. They're structural issues that will not be fought by buying or not buying a particular brand of socks. A lot of these issues are entirely inseparable from capitalism because, well, they are capitalism. The question then then is what does queer liberation actually look like? It's not white Skittles and free Subarus, it's not even just individual rights and equality under the law, it's collective equality. Access to universal healthcare, housing and workplace protections, comprehensive education, a tackling of the current justice system and police force. Queer liberation is anti-blackness, it is climate justice, it is dismantling all forms of oppression. And I suppose what I'm trying to say is you can't buy your way to liberation. And however well it works as a 
visual metaphor, maybe don't use corporations as the battleground on which to pin your hopes for a brighter tomorrow. Or you, like Tokyo here, will be in danger of being crushed underfoot. Thank you so much for watching this video from me and the lads. Uh, if you'd like to help support me making videos like this one or my other work, I will leave a link to my Patreon below, which I actually have just updated with some new exciting perks. So definitely go check it out. We would love to hear in the comments any thoughts that you have about this video topic um, or the new uh, and unusual video format that this has taken. Um, also, once again, thank you to Ritual for sponsoring this video. And if you want to check them out, then that 40% off for Black Friday, Cyber Monday is on now. Uh, go to the link in the description, use the code, get your money off.